Hi, I'm Reverend Craig and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In the last videos we distorted fragments by maths. Now it's time to distort using maps instead of brains. This video will be a simple introduction. We're going to create a very basic heat haze distortion like this one before getting to cooler stuff. But as always a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is meant for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths. So if you see any mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. Let's first just recap what fragment distortion is. The tunnel distortion shader was distorting this green wall image. In the fragment shader we got each fragment's texture coordinate in VV text code. If we always pick the samples from VV text code, then this is what the output looks like, an undistorted image of a green plate wall. But if we shift the texture coordinates for each fragment by telling the shader to take samples closer to the central y-axis, then this stretches the top and bottom of the image like so. So fragment distortion is just about shifting texture coordinates inside the fragment shader. If you want to know more about how this was done in detail, you can watch video 20 about tunnel distortion. A link to the playlist is in the description beneath this video. Now while so far we used maths to distort, this time we're going to send a second texture into the shader and use that texture to distort. The basics about using a second texture to manipulate the main texture are thoroughly explained in the videos on Luma masks. So go watch those as well if you need a refresher. They're in the linked playlist as well. Let's look at the basics first. And this is the image we're drawing. So inside the shader, its texture will be called GM Base Texture. In the sprite editor, I've set it to be on its own texture page, so the texture coordinates range from 00, 0 to 11. 1. And if we grab the sample color at VV text code, we'll draw it without distortion. If you're using TMS1, separate texture page is called Used in 3D. Now let's pass a second texture into the shader and call it Distort Text. The image has the same aspect ratio and is on a separate texture page as well. This means VV text code is congruent, or whatever that's called. We'll also pass in a strength uniform to control the distortion's strength. Now we can get a sample on the distortion texture at VV text code. We only need one color channel since in a grayscale texture, green and blue will be the same anyways, and we'll multiply that by strength. So if the sample's red is 1 and strength is 0.2, we'll set distort to 0.2. Then we get another sample, but this time from TM base texture at VV text code plus distort, so plus 0.2. This means we're shifting the coordinate where we get the sample from, and we shift it down and to the right by 0.2. Now since our distort texture is just a hard-edged white circle in the center, this means everything where the distort texture is black will not be shifted, and everything where the distort texture is white will be shifted by 0.2, 0.2, like in this image. Simple. Now let's look at what happens when we use a soft-edged circle as a distortion texture. Now distort can have any value from 0 to 1 times strength. So pixels at the center will be shifted by 1 times 0.2. Pixels with a gray value of 0.5 on the distort texture will be shifted by 0.1. And this looks pretty cool already. Here's the shader code and both distortion textures in an animated example. Have a look at the animation and the code and continue with this video if you understood what's happening here. This example is in the project file linked beneath this video as well, by the way. Sprites, object shade and room are called test shift, if you want to have a closer look. Now for the heat haze effect, we're going to take this leopard pattern as a distortion texture. It has to be square, its dimensions need to be any 2 to the power of n, and it needs to be tileable. In case you don't know how to do that, I'll show you at the end of the video. And this will be the shader code. Let's go over it step by step. Of course we need the varying vector 2 VV text code to get the coordinate system of the base texture. And the sample 2D distort text to get the distortion texture into the shader. Uniform float time will increase over time so we can animate the effect. Uniform float size will determine the size of the leopard pattern. The larger the number, the smaller it will be. And uniform float strength is to set the strength of the distortion effect. Now in the main function we create a vector 2 distortion and not just a float like in the previous example. That's because I want a different distortion in the y-axis than in the x-axis. Then for the x-distortion, we'll pick a sample from distort text and we'll pick it at fract vv text code time size plus vec2 zero time. I'm going to show what's happening here with an example. Let's say the fragment shader is processing the fragment that would normally be at vv text code 0 0.8, 0 0.8, marked with a yellow circle in this image. And let's say we pass in a size factor of 0.1. 
then BB text code times size would be 0.08, 0.08. That's where the green circle is. We also pass in a time variable which will constantly increase each frame. At the moment of this example, time is 1.5. This means VV text code times size plus vec 20 time returns the coordinates 0.08, 1.58, like shown with the blue circle. If the next step time would be 1.6, then the coordinates would be 0.08, 1.68. So this time uniform constantly shifts the coordinates downwards. But that means the coordinates leave the texture page eventually. In this example, they already have. To fix that, we could turn on texture repeat. But we can also do the same using the fract function. Fract just returns the fractional part of a number. So now the resulting coordinates are 0.08, 0.58. That's where the purple circle is. So we're setting distort x to the red value of the distort texture at those new coordinates. The red value there is about 0.6. Let's say we pass in a strength factor of 0.05. Then distort x would be 0.03. Now let's focus on the time uniform again. As time increases, the purple circle moves down. At the moment, the red value there is about 0.6. But the next frame, the purple circle will be lower and the red value darker, then brighter and darker again, until it reaches the bottom and starts at the top again. So all this code does is get a distortion value based on this leopard pattern. But let's quickly look at the distort y line. I just added three arbitrary factors to size, time, and strength to get different results than for the x distortion. So VV text code times size times 3.4 will return 0 0.27, 0 0.27, represented by the new green circle. The larger the size factor or this 3.4 factor is, the more the coordinates shift into the distort texture. This means the result will look scaled down. That's why a larger size factor results in a smaller pattern. Adding time times 1.6 will change the coordinates to 0.27, 1.77. And getting the fractional turns that into 0.27, 0.77. That's where the second purple circle is. Now the value on the distortion texture at those coordinates is about 0.9. So distort y is 0.9 times strength 0.05 times 1.3, which is about 0.06. And thus the VEC2 distort is 0.03, 0.06. The major part is done, now we need to apply that distortion. And this is the base image we're going to draw. We're still calculating the color for the fragment at VV text code 0 0.8, 0 0.8, shown with the yellow circle. Now we're adding the distort vector to VV text code. So instead of taking a sample at 0 0.8, 0 0.8, we're taking a sample at 0 0.83, 0 0.86, and that's the blue circle. This means whatever color is at 0 0.83, 0 0.86, is drawn at the coordinates 0 0.8, 0 0.8. So the image at 0 0.83, 0 0.86 is basically shifted up and left. I hope this example helped understanding the code and the basic idea. But anyways, time to have a look at the project file linked in the description of this video. We're using two sprites for this demo. One background sprite which will represent the game. This doesn't need to be on a separate texture page because we're going to draw it to the application surface and then distort the application surface. And here's the leopard pattern which has to be on a separate texture page. And here's the shader. We won't need the vertex shader though, just the fragment shader. This is the object. We're going through its events in a minute. And here's the room. We'll just need four sliders and no buttons. And the image we want to distort is on a background layer. This image just pretends to be the game. Let's have a closer look at the object's code. In the create events title region is just a description for this demo project. Nothing important. In the sprite and shader region, we need to turn off the automatic drawing of the application surface. This is a post-processing shader and therefore we need to draw the application surface manually. And then we're setting up the distortion sprite, the shader, its uniforms, and a time variable for the animation. I also added an additional uniform handle, you show result, just for this demo. With this, we will tell the shader to draw not only the base texture, but also the distort texture. This will help understanding how the distortion works. And as always, in the GUID region, I just set up sliders used in the demo project. Again, not important. In the cleanup event, we just turn on the automatic drawing of the application surface again. And the draw event is blank, so the instant sprite won't be drawn. We're drawing and distort the application surface in draw GUI begin event. But of course, you could also use the post draw event instead. First, we'll advance the time variable by a small amount. 
the slider returns 0 to 1, so the time will advance by something from 0 to 0 0.02. Then we'll grab the other slider's values. Size goes from 0 to 4, strength from 0 to 0 0.01, this needs to be quite small, and show result from 0 to 1. With those values grabbed, we can finally set up the GPU and draw the distorted application surface. I'm turning on the linear texture interpolation filter because without it, the effect will look quite horrible. Then we can set up the shader, pass in the distortion texture and the uniforms, draw the application surface, and reset the shader. That's all for the objects code, so let's move on to the shader. I walked you through this code already. The only difference is the show result uniform and the last line. What this last line does is just mixing the distorted image with distort x and distort y. The larger show result is, the more of the distorted image will show, and the smaller show result is, the more of distort x and distort y will show as a red and green color. First let's set distort y to zero though, just for demonstration purpose, and run this. So this looks kinda cool already, but it also looks a bit too regular for my taste. With the result slider we can mix in the value of distort x as a red color. If we slow this down and increase the distortion, it's not hard to see how the leopard pattern is distorting the base texture. The brighter the pattern is, the more it distorts. And also it's easy to understand how the time uniform is working. It is constantly moving the distortion coordinates down and thus the pattern looks like it's moving up. So let's bring that line back in and set distort x to zero instead. Now since I multiplied size, time and strength, this looks different. It's smaller, it's more erratic, but it's still kinda regular. And with show result, we can see how this pattern distorts the y-axis. Now let's reboot this and see the shader with both lines. Now both distortions combined look much more natural. The effect doesn't look regular anymore and the combination of a large and a small pattern at different speeds makes it look more realistic. Well, that's it for the shader. If you don't want to know how to create seamless tiling leopard patterns, then that's it already. If you do, however, it won't take long to explain. I started off with downloading the CC0 photo from Pexels. I picked this one because of the license and because there's a rather large patch of leopard pattern clearly visible. Now the first thing we need to do is stretch this pattern a bit. It should be like if you'd look straight onto the fur. Then we need to crop the image to a nice square patch. Now since we don't need the color and just the values, we can desaturate the image. This will also evenly spread the values to the three color channels. Now to make this seamlessly tileable, we can apply a layer offset transformation. If we offset by half width and half height, the borders of the image move to the center. The next step takes a while, so I'll fast forward through this. The technique is simple though, we just use the smudge tool to remove the seams. Just observe the pattern and try to create a new one that looks kinda logic. It doesn't have to be perfect though. Now the smudging created some small, too bright or too dark areas I don't like. We can use the dodge and burn tool to fix this. In GIMP it's just one tool and you can switch the mode by pressing CTRL.
Now it's time to scale the image to a size of 2 to the power of n. I picked 1024, but for the distortion effect I'd bring it down to 256 or even less. With the size corrected and the seams smudged, we can see there's still some larger areas that need to be brighter or darker. Again, the dodge and burn tool is perfect for that job. Now we can apply the offset again and fix the new seams we created. This will be much quicker than first time. The next step is blurring this image, but if we just blur like this, we'll create new seams. GIMP offers a seamless blur which works nicely, but I'm going to demonstrate another, a bit tedious way, just in case you don't have seamless blur. Create two copies of the layer. Increase the canvas size by 300%. Align the three layers side by side and merge them down to one layer. Make two copies again, align the three layers, and merge them down again. Now you can blur as much as you want without creating seams. The next step is increasing the value range. I want the pattern to go from black to white without losing everything in the middle. The curves tool is great for that. Now just a small blur to fix some histogram gaps created by the Curves tool. And then we can crop the image back to the central tile. And that's it. We got ourselves a seamless tiling leopard pattern created from a CC0 photo. So that's it for this video. As always, I really hope you like this one and are curious about the ones to come. Probably some flag or flame distortion. Until next time.